So I'm Scott lissick and I'm with uh, Basho Japan, and um, this, uh, this whole notion of uh, immutability and checksums and CRDTs and, and uh, uh, building some systems on top. Um, so um, uh, I've been um, with uh, Basho for five and a half years. I've been using Erlang for, for uh, quite a while. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the ACM Erlang workshop um, that uh, is part of the ICFP, a larger conference. It's taking place in Nara, Japan in September this year. And as the co-chair, I strongly encourage you to consider writing a paper. There are three different kinds of, of, uh, of uh, papers and posters for, uh, uh, for consideration for the workshop. Um, and uh, areas of Erlang, Elixir, uh, Akka, uh, Cloud Haskell, and whatnot. So if you or uh, someone you know is, is uh, doing something interesting for user, uh, user experience reports uh, or something a bit more uh, technical or researchy, um, feel free to reach out to me via email or, or, uh, or by Twitter. So um, after that plug, uh, here's the outline of what I hope to talk about. A uh, very brief introduction to Machi, which is the name of the, the product that is embedding all of these uh, uh, primitives I'll be talking a bit about. Uh, a uh, very short bit about append-only files versus write-once files, because they're not exactly the same. Uh, immutability changes everything. Uh, uh, Pat Helland, or at least I don't know who said it first, but Pat Helland, I guess, is, is a little bit famous for saying that. Um, uh, I'll talk about chain replication, um, and then we'll make some music, uh, talking uh, about an allegory of how to manage chain replication without uh, absent a, a system like uh, React Core, which is something that you might expect folks at Basho would use for, uh, for managing a, uh, uh, a distributed system. I'll talk about how CRDTs and checksums are used, um, and then uh, development status of Machi today. So it's a Japanese word. It means a village or a, village or a town. Um, and uh, this thing is still under, under, under construction. You know, it, I'm really sad that, you know, those days are gone where we don't see that guy. Um, but it's a distributed fault tolerant uh, write once blob store uh, with a slightly different, uh, more file like API. It can operate in both strongly consistent and eventually consistent mode. Uh, at Basho, we have this uh, great fondness for uh, eventual consistency stores where availability uh, comes first. Um, and eventually consistent files, like, you know, are you, are you nuts? I mean, people want consistency in their file stores almost always, and um, I want to make a case that there are times when it's not really necessary. Um, when you're uh, writing uh, using a, a, a Unix or Linux uh, system and you want to append uh, only to a file, the, the kernel is responsible for doing the ordering if you, uh, if you specify the, the, the O append uh, option. Um, uh, so we're talking about uh, sort of a file API. We're not talking about the structure of the file system underneath, so nothing about uh, Sprite or, uh, or ZFS, where there's a, conceptually there's a, a, a uh, append-only log that is uh, the basis for something that looks very mutable from the file system layer from the, from the, the POSIX uh, uh, programmer's point of view. Um, instead, something more like uh, Hadoop uh, HDFS in uh, Hadoop, or the Google file system, or Windows Azure storage, um, although the, the Windows Azure case is more blob file store than, uh, than anything else. So file stores versus blob stores, um, I'm not sure if there's a, a great example or great definition for, for the two. Um, I think of it as um, uh, files, it, it, we're, we're used to thinking in Unix land of there are uh, named and ordered collections of bytes and you can have random access uh, to any byte uh, at any offset. Um, Blob store behavior is a bit different in that the client doesn't specify the, the name or where you're going to store the name, where you're going to store something. Um, the, the server instead gives you an opaque string, some kind of name, some kind of opaque blob, and you have to use that same blob thingy, uh, not to be confused with the blob you stored, but this opaque thing, uh, usually a string, to fetch the data back. Um, and Windows Azure Storage does this, the Twitter blob store, the Google blob store, um, and other things. Um, so um, uh, append-only files versus write-once files. Uh, append-only um, usually means that the writes, if they arrive in time, are then um, have a corresponding order by offset uh, inside the file. Uh, for write-once files, um, if you could assign a byte or byte range, a page of, uh, of data, and say, this is your space 
to write in, and you could write in it whenever the heck you want. Um, and so the writes can happen in, uh, in any order. So that's what I mean by a write once uh, file system. Uh, write once file, pardon me. Uh, Erlang users, um, you know, no immutability. We, we know that's going to crash. That's very good. Um, Pat Helland uh, from salesforce.com had this uh, very informal paper, informally written in formal style, uh, in CIDR 2015. I recommend uh, reading it. Immutability changes everything, which is a, a, a great pun or uh, you know, oxymoron or you know, whatever you want to think about it. Um, um, if we wanted to model uh, a write once register uh, in Erlang, say we have this, this write once register record, it's got a couple of elements. There's a Boolean that says whether or not the value is set, and then a value is either undefined or it's uh, some uh, value, uh, um, application specific uh, type. And, <coughs> Um, we intentionally decide we're going to crash if we try to uh, try to set um, a, um, uh, a register that is already set. So that's why we have the guard here uh, for false. We don't have a, a, a corresponding clause for for true. Um, and then when we get, we have the the uh, we'll return undefined or uh, an OK uh, wrapper tuple for the for the value. So um, uh, why? write once files, because um, time is hard. And distributed systems, time uh, sucks even more. Um, and uh, you know, even on the, uh, the human scale, as we heard yesterday from, from Fred, that um, time is hard. So we'll shift the problem to, to dealing with space instead, where the service will, again, assign the, the opaque name or handle. And in Machi's case, it's semi-opaque. It's parsable. It will give you a library function you can parse. You can parse parts of it. Um, and you'll get a file name uh, assigned and a byte offset for, for your write. And then whenever the system gets around to actually using that space, if it ever gets around to using that space, um, uh, it can, it can uh, be processed in any time order. Um, so part of API, um, it's a little simplified here, but um, the client can specify a prefix string as kind of a hint, like I want to use this as a, as a uh, stringy kind of uh, organization method, you know. Um, uh, the chunk that you want to store, the, the blob that you want to store, um, the checksum, the checksum comes from the client. We want end-to-end -end checksum, uh, checksumming in the client. And uh, as we'll see in the read chunk, um, uh, the, well, we'll get to the read chunk in a second. Um, but if, if the, the operation succeeds, you're given the full file name, the prefix is a part, um, but the server gave you the full file name, and it will also give you the byte offset of where that where the first byte of the of the chunk started, um, or will give you an error tuple that doesn't fit on the slide. Um, for reading a chunk, um, you give the full file name, offset, and the size. And um, if that part of the file has been written, um, because these are all write once registers at the byte level, um, then you'll get the chunk. Um, and you get the checksum along with it. Um, and if you read at an offset that is not the original offset used for the write, the server behind the scenes will calculate a new checksum, verify it based on the offset and size that the client is asking for here in the read, and, uh, and then I'll verify it on the server side and then send that checksum back to you so you can, on the client side, verify it again if you wish. Uh, and you should. We know in 2016 that hardware does evil things to you, so you should be checking these checksums. Um, so um, uh, unlike the quorum replication style that, uh, uh, technique that React KV uses for storage, um, I've elected to use chain replication um, for managing the replicas of the files inside of the Machi store. Um, not so many people are necessarily familiar with uh, chain replication. Uh, Neil Conway had said that you know, most, a lot of practitioners have never really heard it before, but uh, most academics uh, have. Mm -hmm. um, I gave a talk um, at Recon uh, last November 2015. If you go to this URL, and the slides will be available shortly, uh, and I'll tweet about the slides also. Um, the navigation is a little difficult. Look for my name, and there's a pointer to the slides in the video. I talk a lot more about the details of, of chain replication uh, and humming consensus that I can fit in uh, time today. Um, there are a bunch of really great papers about chain replication that are uh, quite approachable, I feel. Um, uh, I recommend them. Um, there are several research projects and also commercial products that are using uh, chain replication today, uh, including Machi. 
Um, and here it is in one slide. Um, it's a variation of primary secondary replication, but there's a strict order in which the updates uh, happen. Whereas in vanilla primary secondary, there's, there's no defined order. Um, uh, but this ordering gives us some nice properties. Um, the client uh, here at the top sends a write request to the first uh, element in the chain. We call it the head. Um, the head, if it were in a sort of a transactional context, it could make a commit or abort decision, and then everyone down the line will just sort of observe the, the um, uh, will observe the um, the results of of the of the commit decision made by the head. But we're not using that in this context. Um, but it's mentioned in the original papers. Uh, if the write request um, in Machi's case, the the stuff that we're uh, writing is uh, the, the file name and the offset is unwritten. It's written successfully, then we'll send it down to the middle, and middle and middle, if there are more middles, to the tail. And the right response will go back uh, directly to the client. Uh, for using distributed Erlang, this, this kind of triangular style uh, message passing is very easy to do. Um, uh, uh, another reason for, for liking Erlang. Um, for the reads, um, if we want um, sequential consistency read, we read from the tail. If we want linearizable, we're going to have to check all of them. Uh, Machi's case is a little bit easier in that these, the values are, are immutable. Um, um, so um, uh, the, um, the, the, the main reason for doing a linearizable read would be doing, for, uh, doing a read repair operation if, if there was a partial, if you encountered a partial write where the head was, was written but a crash happened in the middle uh, the uh, middle was unwritten, then you can do a read repair and, and fix things. But uh, if you want a dirty read, you can read from the middle or the, or the uh, a middle server or the head server uh, if you want. Um, and then uh, Mark Callahan had a, a great way of, of, of uh, kind of summarizing the right to the front, reads for the back, it's the mullet of replication. Um, so um, uh, why do you want to use this? Um, I argue there are four good reasons. Um, it's arguably cheap in that you require fewer replicas to survive a number of failures. For quorum replication, you need a minimum of 2f plus 1. Um, chain replication only requires f plus 1. Um, it's easy. Uh, easy, for some quotes of easy. I, I wrote a paper for the Erlang workshop a while, uh, a while ago that talked about an experience with a, a previous uh, project called Hibari DB, which also used chain replication, and talks about how I, I it wasn't quite as easy as the papers made it out to point to, to uh, it wasn't as easy as the academic papers had said, but um, it's, it's, it's uh, quite doable. Uh, Erlang, I think, makes the job much easier. I'm, I'm really glad I didn't have to do it in Java or C. Um, come along for, coming along for free is this uh, anti-entropy effect um, that with quorum style replication, if a server dies, or more than one server dies, heaven forbid, um, you don't have a good idea of what uh, you don't have a way of, of predicting what pieces of data are unavailable, um, that are gone, that, that if those servers never return, is going to be lost forever. Uh, with chain replication, you definitely know. Um, and that is, if there is a surviving chain member um, in, the, in the chain, then the answer is you haven't lost any data yet. Um, and any, uh, uh, any missing data that you observe is going to be uh, as a, a result of a partial write. Um, uh, and Therefore, the, the system has made no commitment um, that that data was, was, was fully written in the first place. Uh, the fourth reason is kittens. So that's cat button. Um, why is managing chain replication a problem? Um, uh, if you screw up the chain order, if you, if you do updates in a different order, then you violate your consistency guarantees. Um, that's bad if you want your system to be strongly consistent. Um, and the state of the art is not ideal. You can have a single oracle that can make these um, management decisions. Um, and uh, uh, that's a single point of failure. So we want to have some replicas. Uh, and then you need to coordinate the replicas. So if you rub some zookeeper on it, um, then you've now changed the availability of your entire system. That your, system, your system's availability falls uh, or descends to the availability of your system's manager. So you're not going to use Zookeeper or etcd um, or any of, the, uh, any of the distributed consensus protocols um, to manage uh, React KV, for example, as an as a eventually consistent data store. Um, we don't want to do the same thing for Machi when it's running in uh, eventual consistency mode. 
um, React Core because of the power of two that is sort of built into one of the fundamental assumptions of React Core um, was one of a few reasons why React Core wasn't suitable. Um, so now we need to uh, come up with an alternative way in, uh, in an eventually consistent environment for managing this stuff. Um, and I, I got this strange uh, uh, inspiration from the IETF. Uh, the IETF at uh, a number of, of uh, meetings for the working groups, if the, the chair wants to hold a vote, uh, voting by paper um, takes a long time if you just want to have sort of a quick, uh, quick poll of the, of the room. Raising hands is too political because then you can see your competitor over there is voting for a motion that you, that you think really sucks. Um, so they, they ask people to hum. And you listen to the volume of the room to, to get a, a sense of whether the, the people in the room are for or against. Um, so what if we, instead of using the volume of the humming we're hearing, that we use the pitch instead? And we're going to get a little musical then. And uh, once upon a time, we have distributed music composers. And we want to compose some music. Um, so everyone follows strict orders, strict rules for composition. So chord progression, rhythm, uh, instrumentation, all of that stuff. Everybody is going to be following the same rules. Um, and these composers are going to make individual decisions about what kind of, what the next measure of music is going to be. And we need rough consensus on that. We don't want people writing different stuff into their manuscripts. Um, everybody's working in the same room and can hear everybody. Um, but sometimes they're not working in the same room. Uh, sometimes one or more will go down to a rehearsal room or they'll go off to the coffee shop. And they might come back later. Uh, they might come back a year later, or they may have left uh, and will never come back uh, when we have to deal with that also. So for the composer's workflow, all of the number, uh, all the measures in the music are, uh, will be uh, numbered. Um, and um, we're writing music from beginning to end. Um, you know, we're not going to be writing the final coda uh, first. Um, we're going to do this one measure at a time. If we have blank measures in the manuscripts, um, you know, composing is kind of a messy business. So um, uh, blank and incomplete measures will be removed by the publisher. We don't have to worry about that. Um, this music is going to be ranked for beauty and lyricism, so we're not going to be mixing Happy Birthday with Michael Jackson and uh, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. That would be bad. So to get very concrete, let's use just plain chant, Gregorian plain song. Uh, so it's monophonic. We don't have to worry about bad chords. Um, it has very strict voice leading rules, um, so it kind of limits the degrees of what a, a composer uh, can do um, from one measure to the next. And as vocal only, we don't have to worry about pesky musical instruments or percussion or anything like that. Um, oh, and this Byzantine chant has nothing to do with the, the uh, uh, Byzantine generals problem. Um, just, just, just saying. So these composers, they're all acting independently. They can hear other composers that are in the same room, but they can't hear anyone. These, these rooms are soundproofed or too far away to hear. And um, each composer has got a private manuscript that they copy the consensus results that they're, that they're hearing in the room. And they use indelible ink, so they can't change their, their, what they write uh, afterwards. They can no editing. Um, We'll also ignore little anachronisms, you know, things like music measures didn't exist in the seventh, you know, sixth, seventh century. Um, so um, here's how we're going to compose a measure of music. We're going to check to see who's in the room. Uh, and we'll also consult what was written earlier, because we want something that's very, uh, very melodic and, and lyrical. And uh, we're going to consult our plain, plain chant rules. Um, and then we're going to choose the next note for a measure. And we're going to hum it. And we'll listen to everybody else humming. And if everyone hums the same pitch, then that's great. We, we have achieved rough consensus. We'll write it in our private manuscript. We're done. Uh, if there is no unison, then uh, we have a disagreement problem. And the answer is we ignore this measure number. Um, and we'll go to a next, we'll choose another measure number, a larger measure number. And we'll go back to the beginning, and we'll do it again. Um, so this is the bit where uh, I had said earlier that if, if measures are blank in our manuscripts, that the publisher will ignore it, um, and that's OK. Um, I, I mean, this is, this is great. Um, uh, you know, there's probably going to be unison fairly often. Again, the rules are pretty strict. There's not a whole lot of options that people could choose. Um, but um, if there is disagreement um, uh, or an interruption, um, someone could enter or leave the room. 
Um, someone could go to sleep, take a nap. I mean, um, you know, uh, um, uh, go comatose. Um, in all of those cases, the response is to write a new measure of music um, for, for all of those things. Um, if someone has gone to sleep in, this, in the same room and they try to reuse an old measure number, um, again, because um, our manuscripts are using indelible ink, if a measure has already been written, well, they can't write um, in, in, in uh, they can't write in that measure of music, um, and then we'll all scold them and tell them, no, dude, you need to use a, a new, a new measure number. Um, so you end up maybe with maybe with uh, music like this, measures 22 to 26, uh, perhaps, um, and that's really cool. So now we'll refine the allegory a little bit, and what if nobody can hear? You know, like. Ludwig van Beethoven is, is one of our composers. So uh, we'll use two manuscripts, and uh, the private manuscript, uh, the one I mentioned here lower, on the lower part, uh, it's the same as the allegory that I just mentioned. Uh, anyone can read from this manuscript, but only the owner can write to it. That was the original rules. We're gonna introduce a new manuscript, it's the public manuscript, and we're gonna write music in this manuscript uh, instead of humming. So we're gonna use our eyes to listen, quote unquote. Uh, anyone can read and write to this manuscript, so this one is fundamentally different um, than the original private. Um, this helps us deal with slow composers or ones that have taken a nap, but they're in the same room. We can actually access their, their manuscript. Um, then the next refinement is then, you know, what if, what if these are compu computers instead of uh, composers and, um, you know, Swedish elves or something? Um, I feel like my eyes are, are blinded here, you know, when I'm working on distributed systems. But how did that happen? I can't, I don't have good visibility in, in what's going on. Um, so we'll try to uh, make things a little bit clearer. So um, we'll consider these measure numbers of music to be an epic number. And an epic is, um, is a logical time. It's a, it's a counter. Um, it should go upward, uh, monotonically increasing. Um, where the chain metadata is stable. The chain metadata includes things like the membership. Who does the administrator, administrator say should be um, uh, eligible to run um, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this small cluster? What is the chain order? Um, and some other pieces of metadata. Um, and instead of paper manuscripts and indelible ink, we're gonna use a key value store of write once registers. Uh, from now on, I'll call this the projection store. And the projection store is a key, it's a two-tuple, it's the epic number, and then the, uh, an atom for the public or private uh, type of manuscript. And the value is a data structure, and uh, it's called the projection, and this projection stores all of the chain metadata, um, the chain order, um, and all that good stuff that we're trying to safeguard. Um, the computers are gonna write to all of the public projection stores to hum. Um, and if then someone after writing, then um, both the writer and everyone else will do a read. And for a particular epic number, uh, the largest epic number that, you, that is, is readable, if you see the same projection from all the different copies, all the different projection stores, and each participant has their own projection store, if you get the same value, this is equivalent to hearing a unison pitch. And at that point, you have to make a decision is this a safe transition from what the, the, the configuration I was using before, or I am currently using, pardon me, to going to this new projection, is it safe? Is it a good idea? And if the answer is yes, then I will write it to my public, or pardon me, I will write it to my private projection store, which is writable only by me. And after I write that, uh, I then start using it, and this is my new configuration, this is my new, my new thing going forward. Um, this sounds really crazy, but it actually works. Um, so um, for different modes of operation, the basic difference is um, the, the, the minimum number of participants to be able to, uh, to propose uh, or to uh, write a projection uh, into the store. Um, we need a minimum number of participants that is uh, at least the quorum majority size in strong consistency land to prevent um, split brain uh, syndrome. Um, for eventual consistency, we can go down to a chain of one, and we just have, you know, just like in React, um, we can have uh, one, one node that is just sort of off by its lonesome, and clients can still talk to it and still get service to the best of that one client's ability, um, and humming consensus will allow us to do the same thing. So, uh, and I'll have an example to, to try to convince you why this, why this 
isn't totally nuts, but when a partition happens, or a crash, it doesn't really matter, um, when it's restarted, humming consensus is uh, sufficient to allow merging and repair operations and file resyncing or anti-entropy, whatever you want to call it, uh, afterwards. The, the Machi files, again, um, the write once registers and the, the server assignments, uh, the file names change each time the epic number changes. And so um, what we end up with is an informal CRDT-like, always commutative, associative, idempotent uh, set of operations. We can always merge the, the files together and not have any conflicts. And that's what we're looking for. Um, uh, distributed systems really ought to have a whiteboard. Um, so a photo from a whiteboard uh, in Tokyo. At Epic 10, we had a chain where the head was, was A, uh, the tail was C, and this is, this is written in the public uh, projection store, so everybody's humming, and uh, we're humming in, in, in agreement. So it, uh, for the sake of argument, author A had written, or server A had written all of these records, but it was fast, it was the quickest, so it was able to write the same record in all three. Everybody is reading, or pardon me, is, it does the read, they're hearing unanimous, and so okay, everybody uses this uses this chain of uh, length three. Then a net split happens uh, during epic 10, uh, and A is, is separated from B and C. Um, B and C have decided that A appears to have failed. We don't know for sure, but we can't talk to it, so we'll assume it's down. And um, for the sake of argument, server B uh, wins the race for the right ones register at epic 11 and says, I'm gonna propose a new chain configuration of B and C, where B is the, is the head. And this is safe to, to uh, go from the chain of, of A, B, C down to uh, B and C, according to our invariance. So should I use this? It's safe. It appears to be a good idea, because I really do think A is down. So I'll start using it. Um, and C will say, oh, Epic 11 is already written. Am I hearing unison? Yes, I'm hearing unison, so I'll use that too. A. Um, if we're in strong consistency uh, mode, um, can only talk to itself. It's in a minority. And so it says, it takes itself out of service and says, I can't do anything, and writes a projection saying there's no service available. And as long as the network split exists, it's fine. No one, no one notices something different. No, one, no individual participant is hearing discord. And when the net split is finally uh, fixed, now we notice that there's disagreement. And the answer here is, OK, fine, we need to propose something else. And again, the winner, whoever that happens to be, at Epic 12 manages to say, well, the chain should be uh, B and C, like the original over here. And then A goes into a special repairing mode uh, at the tail of the chain. And again, uh, everyone reads from these public projections and says, yep, that sounds good. They write it to their private store and start using that projection, and it works. Um, so in summary, um, this projection store is uh, is itself a write once register. Uh, if you hear unison music, meaning that you're reading identical values from the, public, from the public store, then you have to consider the change. If you like the change, you accept it, you write it in your private store, and you start using it. If you don't like the change, if it's unsafe, uh, or you think, no, I, I, I can still talk to that server, I think that's a bad idea, um, then you just propose a new change uh, in a new epic. Um, and uh, so you always have the option of rejecting uh, what someone else has written. Um, and the, the answer, uh, whenever a network partition heals, that's the same case as if there was a race at the beginning for writing conflicting values in the public store. We, 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 we treat, it the same, uh, the, treat it the same way. Um, I will switch to Machi and CRDTs. Um, there's been a lot of talk about CRDTs. Um, <laughs> And the basic rules are associative, commutative, and uh, 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 commutativity, associativity, and idempotence. Um, so I'll kind of uh, skip over that. Um, I already mentioned the informal use um, in that these unique file name and offset assignments uh, create CRDT-like always mergeable files, uh, which is a nice property, but it's not formally coded in a library like uh, React DT, uh, which we use for use case number two. So we use um, the React DT library using the map and a last write win register. And this is used for spamming or broadcasting um, periodic observations of who a particular server believes is down, I mean, having communication problems with. So the key is the observer's name, like A, B, or C in the previous example. 
And then the map value is a list of servers believed to be down. Um, so in, that, in the, the previous case here, um, uh, during, epic, during epic 10 or epic 11, whoops. Ah, which, there it is, sorry. Um, uh, so, um, so B and C will, will, just, will start spamming out this CRDT that's, uh, that both of them will say, I'm having problems talking to A. And uh, A, well, it ends up spamming to itself, but the, the logic is the same, that I'm having problems talking to B and C. So as gossip happens and these CRDTs are always merged, uh, merge together, and if the resulting, if the result after the merge is different, then I'll spam that out again to help propagate information. And eventually we'll find out uh, interesting things like, is the network partition, um, uh, is the network partition uh, symmetric or asymmetric? And we'll build a, a directional graph of where we believe the failures are, and is the, is the partition apparently a one-way thing or a two-way thing? And based on that, the, we'll remove the worst affected servers from any new chain that is, that is proposed uh, in, uh, in a later time. Uh, this is called the fitness, the fitness service. Um, we also use um, uh, checksums as an anti-entropy thing. So like I mentioned, um, in this day and age, we really should be aware of, uh, of uh, mangled, uh, corrupted data. So the client specifies the checksum here. Um, uh, we use the checksum for several purposes. One is for um, verifying that the data is, is, uh, is not corrupted at the initial writing time. We use it for kind of a parity scrub, like uh, rate arrays do, um, for checking, uh, checking for the sanity of data at an individual uh, replica layer. And we also use it for building a Merkle, uh, Merkle tree um, for, uh, for um, uh, faster uh, file comparison. Um, when a server comes back online or is added for the first time. Um, hopefully you know a bit about a Merkle tree and uh, how it's put together. Um, the, 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 the good thing is that once you have this Merkle tree, um, you can very quickly make comparisons by walking down the tree where you find differences or equality. Um, uh, and you can uh, sort through uh, differences uh, quite quickly and, you know, new modern high density servers. The bad thing is that you have to read all of the original data in the first place to make the tree. Um, and modern high density servers this day and age, it still takes a while to, to perform all the IO. So instead of using the original data block for the leaf nodes, we'll use a concatenation of the checksums in our checksum database um, and use that as a proxy for the original data. Um, and so instead of having to read all the original data, we have to read all of the checksums, but at least the checksums are much smaller. Um, and Mark Allen, uh, I'm not sure if he's in the room, but I know he's here, yep, there he is. Uh, he's here in the hallway, and um, he's been writing all that code, and I'm gonna skip over this, and you can pester him after the talk uh, about um, how that goes. Um, so this is a work in progress. Uh, it's not finished yet. Um, this is actually taken from an apartment construction site uh, near my house. They're uh, apologizing for the mud in the street um, uh, and the, the noise uh, during construction. Um, today, the humming consensus, um, it's fully implemented. It's, th this is all in Erlang, by the way, uh, with the exception of level DB, um, it, which is used for the, the, the checksum, checksum status and the, the right once register state uh, enforcement. Uh, but everything else is in pure Erlang. Uh, it works well in a network partition simulator. Um, I'll talk about that partition simulator in a little bit. Um, Property-based testing is so invaluable, with, a, with or without QuickCheck. Um, I have very strong opinions about the, the loveliness of QuickCheck, um, but um, the, the properties um, that I'll talk about um, uh, for chain replication, for example, um, and then using this to putting them in the simulator and then codifying uh, the enforcement of the invariants, uh, invariants has found numerous bugs that the real world would probably find. Having said that, we haven't actually run in the real, real world yet, um, so a lot, most of the testing is all uh, simulator-based. It's uh, Apache version two, uh, public license, uh, and it's available at GitHub under the Basho organization, and again, it's called Machi. Um, here is, this may be a little small um, for, for people in the back, I'll, I'll zoom into this. This is a supervision tree from the, from the uh, AppMon uh, app. It's built into the OTP. 
uh, distribution. And for a particular, uh, a particular server uh, internally called F1, uh, we create a supervisor and a number of worker processes underneath it. So if we zoom in a little bit, um, uh, let's see, we'll ignore the lifecycle manager, but um, is the pointer not working? Oh, I'm putting my thumb over the, okay. Right, so we have the fitness server. I mentioned that a little bit. This is the thing that is, um, is using the CRDTs and the up-down, or I believe it's up, I believe it's down status, and then it's responsible for a very, very dumb uh, spam to all of the other members in the chain, and if it works, great, and if it doesn't, we don't care, it's a send and pray thing. Um, we didn't need to use Plumtree or anything like that um, because these chains are gonna be pretty small. A really long chain is like seven or nine uh, items, and so spam the CRDT and it, the, the, those numbers, it, or that size, it doesn't really matter quite so much. We have the projection store. This is the right one store that I talked about um, for the projections, and Humming Consensus uh, uh, uses this. Um, there are uh, processes that are used for managing uh, metadata uh, uh, inside of the store um, and uh, the interface to LevelDB uh, and the checksum database uh, internally. Um, uh, we have a file name manager for managing uh, file names uh, space on disk. Um, there's the chain manager. This is the thing that's actually executing um, uh, humming consensus. That is how humming consensus algorithm is running inside of this guy. Uh, this is the actual server that's doing the file I.O. on itself and then down below, I cut it off our ranch processes for TCP uh, listeners and, and uh, workers terminating uh, protocol buffers is, is, the, is the API that we use here. Um, uh, quick check is a harsh mistress. Um, but you know, production environments are also uh, quite harsh, and I, you know, it's great to find, uh, it's great to find errors um, uh, in the simulator uh, before, before customers find them. And at the moment, we still have the luxury of not having customers, so. Um, anybody in the room who hasn't done property-based testing of any kind of sort at all? I mean, you've probably heard about it, but have you actually not used it yet? That's a fair number of people. So, I mean, just as a really basic outline, any library or function or, or, or app that you want to test has some kind of invariance. Mm -hmm. so, Figure out what those are. Even choose one as a, as a starting point. Um, and this is your property. Um, and then your next task, I feel, is to write code to make that invariant and check that enforcement, make it executable, write a function that can figure out whether the, the, the uh, invariant has been violated. Um, and now you're flexible. You can plug it into anything you want. Uh, your, your own uh, uh, testing framework, EE unit, common test, uh, proper and quick check. If you want to uh, use a, a tool that has a lot of other infrastructure, other kind of nice things to help out with your testing, but you don't have to use proper or quick check to get started. Um, and you can check these invariants at runtime. I mean, you know, Erlang programmers, we, we sort of use this all the time, and you know, other Beam languages for pattern matching that if we are expecting only one result, then the heck with it, we're just going to pattern match on that one result, and anything else is an error and it crashes, that's great. Um, maybe you have to annotate your code with some additional assertions or probes that would catch the failure at runtime. Maybe you have to catch the, the invariant uh, failure after the fact, like you write everything to an event log and you can use just an append-only file and write records to that and, and post-process them later. However you wanna do that, if you make the invariants executable, um, you make your job a lot easier, uh, or at least it has in, in uh, every project that I've worked on in property-based testing since I've, I've learned about it from, uh, from the Cubic folks. Um, mm -hmm. Here's some of the invariants for chain replication, uh, at least how it's done Machi style. So Machi uses chain replication uh, implementation that is more like Corfu, which is something that came out of Microsoft Research uh, a few years ago and it is different from the original chain replication algorithm, uh, algorithms um, that have been described in the literature that I very briefly uh, skipped by uh, earlier in the talk. Um, so we have, uh, Machi maintains this notion of, of servers that are perfectly in, uh, are in sync, or uh, servers that are out of sync or under some kind of repair or anti-entropy. And we want to keep these things separate because if we don't keep them separate in strong consistency mode, we will violate consistency constraints. Uh, again, for consistency constraints, we never reorder 
the in sync portion of the chain. That's just, that's bad. That can never happen. Um, um, a server can go from in sync to down or to repairing uh, at any time. Uh, that is safe because things often repairing uh, are not used for uh, a lot of operations. Um, if we go, if we want to move a server from repairing, uh, from the repairing list to the in sync list, um, we had to have had a repair effort, the anti entropy for copying files either in one direction or both directions, depending on the mode. That repair effort had to have started, it had to have run to completion, it was okay. Then it's all right to move from repairing to in sync. And when we do that, we have to do it only at the end of the list, um, again, for, uh, for consistency's sake. Um, I have a network simulator, um, it is also written in Erlang, and uh, it has a very simple model. We have this list of two tuples, uh, a name, uh, from from and to, and if uh, if a a and b is the from and to, then we can simulate a true one-way network partition. So a messages sent from a to b will fail, but b to a can work. And if you do this using Damocles uh, in the Erlang world for twiddling with the network interface uh, to block uh, packets uh, sent in one direction, if we're using TCP, sooner or later you're going to have the TCP window close, and you're affecting messaging in both directions, where, whereas in, in the, the, the simulator environment, we can have true one-way uh, network partitions uh, for arbitrarily long periods of time, or logical time, um, and uh, uh, so that's very different and exposes new really cool failure scenarios um, when, when there's partial connectivity, partial visibility to read or write uh, into the projection stores. Um, and we can change this list, we can make it constant, or we can just random, randomly, uh, randomly uh, 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 let it change. I, I, I think of it as, as shaking the snow globe. We really want to randomize things, and little snowflakes kind of fall all over their place as the chain manager states um, sort of change and are flying uh, like snow inside of the snow globe. Um, then we'll fix the partition list, and we'll wait for stability. Uh, do, we, do we have uh, all of the servers unanimous in which chain they belong to. And there may be more than one chain. Again, if we're in eventually consistent mode, the worst case, everybody is partitioned from everybody else, so everyone forms chains of one. But they remain stable. Uh, and we fail if it's never stable. Um, and then uh, at the end of the run, we'll check an activity log to make certain that all of those invariants that I just talked about for chain replication have not been violated. Um, and um, the the that's the end of the, the sort of the overview of these things. Uh, my cat thanks you. The, the, the Swedish elves thanks, thank you for your time. Um, the, all, of the, all of the code is available, like I said, at, uh, at GitHub. Um, for more information about the overall design, details about the chain manager and humming consensus, um, and the, the unfinished work for um, uh, partitioning or uh, sharding, horizontal scalability, whatever you want to call it, um, is in the doc directory, um, so you can check out the repo um, or look at it uh, there online. And uh, at that point, um, there's time for questions if there are any. Thanks. Sir? Uh, the question is, um, do the clients check to, or, so, um, uh, let's do this, it'll be faster. We'll go and we'll get a diagram. Um, the question was, do, do the clients connect to all of the servers um, when they want to do something? <coughs> oh, there it is. Um, and the answer is, in the original uh, chain replication, um, uh, you're typically dealing with the head um, uh, and uh, the tail. But Machi is doing things in a Corfu style, which actually means that the client, all of the chain replication logic is in the client. So the, the servers are, are simpler as a result because they're not actually communicating directly to each other. The, the pattern is instead client sends to the, to the head. If it gets an OK back, then it sends the, the, the right operation to the middle and then back and then to the tail and then back. So there's more network manage, uh, messages in that way for doing a write. Um, but the, the client then has to connect to all three. How does uh, the chain order? It is a client and reads from the projection stores. 
So, it, so humming consensus running independently in each one of these bricks is kind of do, uh, servers, pardon me. Um, this is a diagram that taken from the Hibari DB, so that's why it's using the word brick, sorry. Um, uh, so the, the, the public and private projection stores, as I had mentioned, are being used by humming consensus, but they're also accessible to the clients. So the clients have to start off with a hint of who, you know, what are the possible participants, and then can bootstrap contact each of the projection stores on each of those, and then if one of them is available, get some more information that's probably more up to date, and then continually refreshes it, learns what the, cur what the current state of, of the chain is now, because it's hint on disk, maybe hours or days old. Um, but it can eventually find the current, uh, uh, the current projection in the same way that Humming Consensus discovers it with the, with the server participants. Um, so the, the question was, um, uh, why, why make this choice of, of the, the client-driven logic, um, and why not choose the, the, the fewer number of messages case? Is, is that a fair way to summarize? Um, and the answer is uh, the, the original Corfu research, and a, a, uh, a proof of concept that I'd written for Basho internally, um, and is also in the, in the repo, by the way, if you want to go look at it. There's a prototypes directory. You can look at the nasty code written in a week. Um, and um, that Corfu um, uh, implementation followed the original Microsoft research papers, and they, they also had a research agenda kind of off on the side. They wanted to have the servers really simple, like put it in an ASIC simple. And so the complex logic of, of the chain replication and dealing with failures, they wanted in, in the, the smarter client. And I followed that pattern. Um, sooner or later, for efficiency reasons, um, uh, we may move things to the original pattern, that, that uh, communication pattern that you see here, but uh, that's future work. And for one more question, I think. One more question, anyone? Oh. Um, what, if any, relation does Mac have to the actual uh, Same parent company, I guess. Um, <laughs> the, the original use case for this is to replace the, the blob store that React KV is currently the function that React KV is currently providing for the, the S2 product, the, the S3 uh, protocol compatible server. Um, for big objects, what S3 does is it breaks, it, it breaks up the, the, the data into one megabyte uh, chunks and then writes those one megabyte uh, key value pairs into React KV. And Machi's uh, eventual consistency mode was to replace that blob store. Thank you very much for your time.